Jade has a long history in our hemisphere, going back thousands of years, as evidenced by carvings found in ancient tombs and temples. But for much of modern history, it was believed that the sources of Olmec and Mayan jade were lost to history without a trace. That is, until Jay and Mary Lou Reidinger rediscovered sources of jade in Guatemala in the 1970s. Today, we'll be talking to Mary Lou about the Central American jadeite sources she and her husband found and the significance of jadeite in Guatemala. Welcome, Mary Lou. Thank you so much, Jordan. I'm really happy to be here and talking to you. Oh, I'm happy that you're here. It is an honor. I just read your article. Uh, Everybody who's listening, Mary Lou just wrote an article called Stone of Kings, Jade in Mesoamerica, and it was recently published in the new Richard Hughes from Lotus Gemology's book, Jade, a Gemologist's Guide, and it is a fantastic read with a timeline of jade in Guatemala. Now, Mary Lou, you say that you didn't discover the jade in Guatemala, but you rediscovered it. As an archaeologist, can you tell us a little bit about jade's ancient history in our hemisphere? Yes, I can. Uh, the The jade in Guatemala was was really the first pieces that were worked and traded and carved. It's about fifteen hundred BC. So I count fifteen hundred BC to fifteen hundred AD. And the reason it all stopped in fifteen hundred AD is because of the Spanish conquest and the Spaniards came to the New World uh, looking for gold. They came uh, to convert people to Christianity. They found the local people worshiping jade. They declared the worship of jade to be idolatry, worship of false idols, punishable at the time of the Spanish Inquisition by torture and death. So it didn't take the local people very long to figure out if you wear it or trade it or carve it, guess what? They're going to kill you. So within 20 years of the Spanish conquest, uh, the Jade fell into the background. Nobody knew about it. Nobody talked about it. And the jade standard was replaced by the gold standard because jade was also money. It wasn't just uh, it wasn't just uh, uh, something that was a luxury trade item. It was actually the money that was used to pay for things. So when the Spanish first came here, they wouldn't have really understood this long, long standing significance with the culture of the people at the time. The jade was, was, uh, it was a unit of trade also. And the, the basic celt axe head shape was what was traded uh, all the way from central Mexico down to Costa Rica. So it was, that, that's the area that archaeologists call Mesoamerica. So it was traded throughout Mesoamerica for 3,000 years. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's a long time. It sounds like some archaeologists also kind of wonder if there was similar to like a Silk Road, maybe a Jade Road or like a Jade Route where trade would have happened. I know it's all speculation. The problem is the, when I was in graduate school in Mexico 50 years ago, my professor said there's no Jade in the Americas, only jade I. And the, this problem with using the words jadeite and nephrite and jade, I have to explain, I've probably explained it thousands of times in my career, but jade is a generic term. And the correct mineralogical terms are jadeite and nephrite. So because people didn't understand that jadeite is jade, uh, it was very confusing for people to go on a hunt to look for jade if they thought that it was only jadeite and jadeite wasn't jade. So there you go. Um, That's been a problem from the very beginning in our business because people would walk in and say, oh, this isn't really jade, it's just jadeite. And they didn't know that jadeite is the more valuable form of jade and it's rarer and it's it's uh, it takes brighter colors and a better polish and it's it's a higher quality stone in terms of value of the nephrite, but people didn't understand that. So that was one of the reasons it took a long time for for people to seriously take our business seriously in Guatemala, but also uh, for the academic world to understand what jade is. And that's kind of how your story with Jade started too, isn't it? When uh, when you and Jay were friends right before yeah. before you were uh-huh. married or even dating, uh, didn't you tell me that he actually he called you up to say I'm looking for Jade and you you didn't believe you didn't believe him? No, that's right. <laughs> I said no. There's no Jade in the Americas. Only Jade. I, but after he got hold of William Foshag's study, 
uh, which was published by the Smithsonian in 1957. Uh, and he put it under my nose and I read it. I realized, of course, of course, there's Jade in the Americas. Let's go look for the Jade in the Americas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you guys found the Jade, I mean, a lot of that was based off of Foshag's research, wasn't it? Uh, you know, the difference between what Foshag did for 20 years looking for jade sources in Guatemala and what we were able to accomplish in nine months is when Foshag was in graduate school, he didn't know about plate tectonics. And in the 20s and 30s, anybody who talked about plate tectonics would be thrown out of the academic world. By the time I was an undergraduate in the 60s, uh, plate tectonics was accepted geological theory. And so the minute I got to Guatemala, I wasn't just doing what Foshe was doing because he was looking for serpentine deposits because he didn't know about plate tectonics. I immediately went and got geological maps and saw where the, the, the tectonic plate boundary was and saw all of the fault lines on either side of the tectonic plate boundary and understood that the jade is formed through subduction faulting on tectonic plate boundaries. So poor Foshag never had that knowledge. And of course he died even before his book was published in 57. So um, I sort of used Foshag's knowledge and jumped off on my own. But also there wasn't any, uh, any manual that can tell you how to look for jade. So I really had to take my rock hammer and use my rock hammer. If it, if it made a certain noise when I would hit a boulder and bounced, that minute it was jade, and if it didn't bounce as much and didn't make a certain noise, it wasn't worth even testing. So the, the pieces that, that came off of the boulder that would bounce and make the certain noise are what we sent to the GIA. And so once we realized that we really needed GIA assays to prove to the world that we had jade of Guatemala, then we were off and running because I, we had to figure out what was potentially jade and what wasn't. So it's, if, it, if, it, uh, if it, we started using heavy liquids and if it doesn't sink in heavy liquids, just throw that boulder away. It's, if it does sink, then send it to the GIA and find out if it's jade. So. Wow. I, mm -hmm. I'm trying to imagine you walking around with, with, your, with, with your hammer <laughs> and hitting, hitting jade, listening for the, I'm guessing it's like a ping sound because jade pings. Mm -hmm. Well, if you go on our website, you can see me with the hammer hitting the jade and you can do it. So. That is the coolest. <laughs> I'm going to mm -hmm. have to do that. That is awesome. So mm -hmm. your story, I mean, you were living in Mexico at the time. Is that mm -hmm. correct? When you correct. sort of picked up and left and went on this wild adventure searching for jade that wasn't even believed to be there. That's right. <laughs> The story of Jade in your life is kind of your love story too, isn't it? Absolutely. I love that about it. So I actually, I just finished, um, for everyone watching and listening, Stone of Kings. And it's actually, it's, it's actually, it's a book about Mary Lou, just so you guys know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, and my husband. it's really about the two of us together. It, it is. And it is such a fantastic story and I can't I cannot recommend it enough it was excellent and a very very good very fast read I ate it up within a couple of days and um because I was I was really invested in it but it really it it touched me because you know I always say I always say Jade is a love story and I always really think of it that way because the reason that I sell Jade the reason that my husband sells Jade is because that's something that is important to him and you know I, I love my husband and I love Jade. And so it's something that we have and share together. And we're reps for Mason K, which is a company that's owned by a husband and wife. And it just seems like there's kind of this element of romance to this, this huge 8,000 year story of Jade. And so I really, really enjoyed Mary Lou reading about you and your adventures with Jay, <laughs> your husband finding Jade, and then and then starting the very first Guatemalan Jade business in Guatemala in Antigua. Is that mm -hmm. right? That's right. And it was a it was a, a challenge because when we first started, we built the factory, we ordered the equipment, we taught the descendants of the Mayas how to carve Jade the way their ancestors had. 
we decided that we were going to make something totally different from what is made in Asia. No elephants and no hearts and no bangles, etc. We were going to make replicas of pre-Columbian jade pieces. So we started making masks and figurines and carvings and things that had more of a non-modern, non-Chinese style. And um, it was it was a real challenge for about 13 years because people would walk in and Guatemalans would walk in and say, well, we know this isn't jade because we know we don't have jade in Guatemala. And European tourists, American tourists would walk in and say, well, we think jade is green and comes from China. And so for 13 years, it was a terrible struggle. And uh, I, after two or three years of being laughed at and called crazy, I just uh, told my husband, I said, I just think we have to give this up. I don't think anybody's ever going to buy any jade. I think that people think that we're, you know, ridiculous con men and trying to sell something that isn't jade to them. And I just want to walk away. And my husband said, never. <laughs> so he wasn't ever going to give up on this. But what really changed things was the article in National Geographic in September 1987. And all of a sudden, National Geographic said that, yes, we had jade in Guatemala. And here's a picture of Mary Lou Ridinger in Guatemala and saying she has a jade mining operation in Guatemala. All of a sudden, everybody in the world decided, yes, they do have jade in Guatemala. It's on the map. So 13 <laughs> years of, of suffering finally paid off, but not by anything we did, but by the publication of the National Geographic article. And that's so that's Ward. a good story about the what National is? Geographic artist cuz is that weren't you out to lunch when the reporter came by? Yeah. Well, no. He called saying that he was going to call back and talk to me and um I went out to lunch and I came back and my secretary said he was shocked that you went out to lunch and he said, "Did you tell her who I was?" And my secretary <laughs> said I did, and she went out to lunch. <laughs> anyway, Fred Ward, the author, and I laughed about that for years. We became very good friends, and it's sort of like it was a byword of "you went out to lunch." <laughs> <laughs> you you definitely had some struggles with until that article convincing people that that there was actually jade, that it was actually jade in Guatemala. But even, even after that, did it still take some time for people to really embrace it as a, as a jewelry material? That was a turning point, and it's taken quite a while for Guatemalans to really appreciate the fact that they have jade. But now it's, it's, it's beginning to catch on among Guatemalans, uh, obviously Mexicans, because they know that jade's a very important part of their history. So some of our best uh, customers are, are Mexican because they, they appreciate the history of jade in Mexico, but there are millions of jade artifacts in museums in Mexico that all originated in Guatemala because they don't have a source of jade. So. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. And you mm -hmm. actually, you had a jade store for many, many years that is now a museum, correct? Mm -hmm. It's still a store. <laughs> oh, that's right. It's still a store. <laughs> yeah. And it's called it's called Jade Maya. And we have we have um before the pandemic we had 12 stores. We now have five. Um and um uh, six of our stores uh have always been museum style stores because you can't you can't sell jade to people who don't know the history and can't hear the history and appreciate it. So all of our stores are really Jade Museum stores. And we have a wonderful Jade Museum store on an island for cruise ships in Belize and Harvest Key Belize. Uh, and we have one in uh, Puerto Chiapas in the Port of Mexico. And so we, we really try to trade the Jade in places where it was traded for 3,000 years carrying on an incredible legacy. That is amazing. And I'm sure it's it's very well received. When you tell people the story of Jade, which is so incredible, um, I think people want to take a piece of that history with them. And the story of Jade in the Americas is what tells the story of 
the Olmec civilization, it sounds to me like kind of coming across Olmec history and coming across Olmec jade were kind of hand in hand. I think you can look at at Olmec and Maya as having very similar roots, the people uh, and the traditions, and the Olmec sort of evolved and coexisted with the Maya, and then they became less predominant culturally, and the Mayas became the dominant culture, but they're actually seven different cultures over a period of 3,000 years that all work jade. So the Aztec culture and the Toltec culture and the Zapotec culture, Teotihuacan culture, Costa Rican culture, uh, they all had their own jade traditions, their own jade styles, um, their own jade story. But they were all getting it from the same source. What do you think was so special about jade to them? Jade to them, uh, they realized that everything was going to die and be destroyed and be demolished and that hurricanes and earthquakes and floods were going to carry everything away. And the only thing that was permanent was jade. So jade became the equivalent of talking about immortality or eternity. And they started burying their rulers with their bodies covered with jade, the same way the Chinese did. They buried their rulers with their bodies covered with jade because you were going to become immortal. Uh, So that's a big attraction, uh, is if you have enough jade on your body when you die, you win immortality. So that was uh, (laughs) very... Whoever has the most jade wins. (laughs) Exactly. So it was was traded as a luxury good, and uh, it was only the really important uh civilizations and leaders of those civilizations got got the good jade <laughs> something that we haven't really touched on yet is one of the things that makes guatemalan jade particularly unique and that is its blue color and if if i'm correct the olmecs really appreciated the blue jade whereas it sounds like the mayans maybe were more drawn to the green jade is that correct Uh, The Mayans had blue jade and the Olmecs had green jade. Uh, The the high quality Olmec is either apple green or Olmec blue, but Olmec blue is very specific to uh, certain areas of the Olmec world. And it comes from a certain area of Guatemala. What I'm wearing today is I'm wearing lavender jade. And if you see the black spot there, that's chromium. So that's apple green jade and with chromium, and that's what makes it green. And this Gorgeous. is lavender. <laughs> I love them. Oh, my gosh. It's so beautiful. This, which is sort of uh, rainbow jade because it's got a certain amount of pink in it as well. So. I love seeing the pink. And so in, in the Guatemalan material, do you normally refer to the purple as more of a lilac? Is that what you we call do. it? We use the term lilac. And it, it tends to be a very soft purple, but... It, it sounds like a lot of people didn't even know there was lilac or, you know, in the Burmese material, we usually call it lavender jade. It sounds like people didn't even know that that color existed in the Guatemalan material until really recently. The dynamic between my husband and me is he was the visionary and I was the prove it to me scientist. I've got to have facts. You know, I want, I want you know, to see the evidence for this. And there were no artifacts. So I didn't believe we were ever going to find lavender jade in Guatemala because I didn't know of any artifacts. It turns out there are two artifacts, uh, but I didn't know about them. So when we, yes, opposed to millions, <laughs> it turns out that the lavender jade wasn't appreciated or or carved or traded by the people and the greens and the blues were. So uh, when we found the lavender, I said, well, this can't be. And then we sent it to the GIA for an assay, and it came back, I think, 75% jadeite. So, and it has titanium in it uh, that makes a lot of the purple, titanium, uh, manganese, iron. Uh, But it's, um, we we also sent it off to the Hong Kong Gym Laboratory, and they, they really liked it as well. So. Uh, it's it's very distinctive. It's different from most of the, the Myanmar uh, lavender, um, but it's it's a beautiful stone and, and it uh, makes beautiful jewelry. So 
anyway, so so the GIA said yes, it is, and Mary Lou said where the artifacts and <laughs> found out there were only a couple. I can tell you that we we found it and we had it assayed in 1998. Before that, there was no lavender jade in Guatemala. So anybody who says, oh, well, I know about it. I've had this piece since 1985. You could say, nope, you haven't. <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> yeah. And then in yeah. addition to the really surprising find of lilac jade, you guys also have another really unique color of jade. And uh, it's it's a black jade with, is it pyrite inclusions? We sent that off to the GIA as well, and the GIA said numerous metallic inclusions, and we sent the metal inclusions off to a metallurgical lab, and they said, I think, something like 80% pyrite, 3% gold, 4% platinum, 7% silver, and it's got zinc and nickel. It's got seven different metals, predominantly pyrite, but it does have gold and silver and platinum in it. That's called galactic jade. Galactic jade. So you guys have some really unique. I think I think the realm of Guatemalan jadeite is often misunderstood, and I don't think people realize the range that it has. You have the vivid greens, and you have the blue. Um, and it actually, like it seems like there's a range of blue in the Guatemalan material, and then of course the lilac that we discussed, and the galactic jade. And we also have a beautiful white jade, and I, th I think you've heard the story about how uh, the parliament in Ireland commissioned a sculptor to make a life-size sculpture of Oscar Wilde out of jade. And so the sculptor uh, did his shoes in black jade, and he used a lot of uh, Canadian jade, and he, uh, he carved from jade all over the world. But he made a mistake, which is he the original Oscar Wilde statue had porcelain, white porcelain head and hands for Oscar Wilde, not Jay. And immediately the, it began to weather and the porcelain began to crack and it was a mess. And so he started contacting everyone in the world he knew who carved Jade. He contacted Kirk Makepeace in British Columbia and a couple of people in China and they all said, no, the largest source of white jade that we know of is Mary Lou Ridinger in Antigua, Guatemala. So the sculptor, Danny Osborne, made a trip to Antigua, got into our, our swimming pool full of jade and picked two, three pieces for two hands in the head of Oscar Wilde. So now if you go to Dublin and you're walking between the Houses of Parliament through Marion Park to Oscar Wilde's childhood home on the other side of Marion Park, you will run into Oscar Wilde, life-size, sitting on a boulder in the middle of the park. You now know that his head and hands are made out of white jade from Guatemala. We, we've seen how jade was extremely significant to ancient civilizations, um, that the Spanish were very confused by it and sort of muted the jade culture um, of Central America at that time. And then it really it really lied dormant until the 20th century with Foshag's work, and I know the exploration of a few other archaeologists and other people, and then, of course, you and your husband discovering or rediscovering uh, jade deposits in Guatemala. It's such a fascinating history. Can you tell me about the future of Guatemalan jade and, and kind of what you, what you think is going to happen next? Well, it's becoming obvious that people in China and Canada and the U.S. and Mexico are discovering it as an art medium. And they're discovering that they can create beautiful objects out of jade. And it's, it's amazing to me that all the years that I spent trying to sell jade in China, that now the Chinese, some of the master carvers are carving with Guatemalan jade, which I, it's just, I'm so thrilled by it because originally when we decided to, bring back the jade industry in Guatemala, the idea was is that the world thought that jade was all from China. And we wanted to let people know that the jade does come from other places in the world because other places in the world have built their own jade industry like New Zealand has. And, um, and Canada's beginning to. People are beginning to realize that jade comes from Canada. Uh, but we really 
started the ball rolling, I think, with Guatemalan jade to make people understand that it is a source of jade and it's fine jade and it's jadeite jade and it's uh, unique and beautiful. So I think that if the government of Guatemala gets serious about protecting their jade sources, there's probably enough jade in Guatemala for about another five to 10,000 years. If they don't, it could all be gone in about five years. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that, that Guatemala will, will begin to appreciate the jade industry. Uh, they, they have extractive industries that they um, sell nickel and gold and silver out of Guatemala and uh, they don't have anything that they can create in Guatemala except a jade industry. So I'm hoping that uh, more and more people in the country get interested. It provides jobs in Guatemala. It's also important for people who have collected pre-Columbian jade because it's illegal. Jade belongs in museums. And um, we are offering to collectors an alternative where they can buy a replica of the original uh, and many of the originals aren't really jade. Many of the originals are fuchsite and serpentine and other, other types of stone material. And we can guarantee that it is jade, that it's made by a Guatemalan artisan, and that it is uh, a museum quality replica that they can proudly display in their home without having to indulge in robbing museums and robbing archaeological sites. Let's, let's all abide by the law, people. <laughs> Come on now. Stop stealing jade. No, I think that's wonderful. And I think it, I really love what you said about um, just trying to put put that money and that power in the hands of the Guatemalan people and actually improve the lives of individuals who are in Guatemala. Well, the jade belongs to the Guatemalan people. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the people of Guatemala. And it's up to the people to encourage their government to protect it. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a source of pride for Guatemala now because people didn't have that source of pride 40 years ago before I started. People now can point to something that is theirs, that is not brought in from Europe or brought in for the United States. And it's, uh, it's something that is Guatemalan and uniquely Guatemalan and valuable in Guatemala. It's authentic. It's authentic. Mm -hmm. I love that. If you don't mind sharing, you told me an incredible story and then I reread it again in the book about an early customer of yours who had purchased Guatemalan <laughs> jade, of course, and and then actually met the wife of the ambassador to Guatemala. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> Can you tell that story? The woman was a very socially prominent woman in Washington, D.C., and she bought the jade, one of the first jade necklaces we ever created when we realized we could be making jewelry. That had never occurred to us for two years. <laughs> but finally it occurred to us, why don't we make some jewelry? <laughs> so we made a necklace. The woman bought it, and then she wrote a very angry letter because she'd gone to dinner at a very fancy dinner party, and she'd sat next to the Guatemalan ambassador's wife. And she said, oh, look at this. Jade necklace I got in Guatemala, and the ambassador's wife said, no, we don't have jade in Guatemala. Somebody just sold you a bill of goods, and it's fake, and it's not jade. And the woman was just absolutely crushed, and she was so upset. And she'd been humiliated, really, and called a fool because she'd been, been sold a bill of goods in Guatemala, and it was a fake necklace and wasn't really jade. So we gave her her money back. And we wrote a letter to the Guatemalan embassy and we said, uh, why don't you, because you're in Washington, D.C., go to the Smithsonian and look at their collection of Guatemalan jade and look for the publication of the Smithsonian called Mineralogical Studies in Guatemalan Jade and then go to the Dumbarton Oaks Museum, which is in Washington, D.C., and look at some of the beautiful jade pieces from Guatemala in the Dumbarton Oaks Museum. And then let us know if you still believe there's no jade in Guatemala. <laughs> oh, snap. So, 
<laughs> you ran into that ambassador's wife years later, didn't you, in, in Houston? It turns out she was a friend of my mother's. And my mother heard the story that her daughter had had sold a fake necklace, a fake jade necklace to this friend of hers. So, ah. <laughs> 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 but yeah, it was it was hard. It was really hard at the beginning, uh, not to get laughed at, and it was uh, hard for me and my reputation as a scientist to be told that I was selling fake jade. Mm -hmm. So. And it took some time for the archaeological community to embrace you again, because it sounds it like did. they thought, they thought you were a fraud. They, they thought and you I were really, selling fake stuff. I really had to make a decision early on because uh, my husband realized that if we told everybody in the world where our jade source was, we wouldn't have it very long. And so for the first 20 years we were in the jade business, uh, I had to withdraw from the academic world because in, as an academic, my responsibility is to say, it's right here, here's the GPS. But the minute it became public knowledge, yes, everything was, uh, was poached by the Chinese and by uh, everybody in the world who wanted to come down and pick up their piece of jade from Guatemala. And it caused a lot of social uh, problems in Guatemala of people who were stealing it and selling it on the black market and selling it illegally. And it, the first 20 years, it was, we decided that if the jade belonged to the people of Guatemala, anybody who wanted to steal jade from us in Guatemala, all of our neighbors and poor farmers, et cetera, welcome to it. So we, we really... But anybody who's Chinese and is going to come dig for jade, no. Because all we did for 40 years basically has been surface collection. We don't dig for jade. And we do the same techniques of jade mining that the Mayas and the Olmecs did, which is we only pick it up off the surface. And the Chinese started bringing in heavy-duty equipment and leveling the mountaintops and strip mining. And, and it's, uh, it's pitiful. Jade deserves better than that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Guatemala deserves better than that. That's that's true. way outside their rights. <laughs> they're, not allowed, they're not allowed to do that. <laughs> Interesting. Well, Mary Lou, that, I mean, it, I could listen all day to your stories. I, <laughs> you are so knowledgeable on this subject, and I am just absolutely enthralled with your experiences and the challenges that you've overcome and your role in this very long and fascinating history of Jade in our hemisphere. Um, is there anything else you wanted to mention that we didn't get to? I just want to in invite everybody to come to Guatemala and take a museum tour and visit the museum and you can check out our website. And uh, if you can't come to Guatemala, you can, uh, order <laughs> from our website so um and yes we would we would really appreciate everybody who can visit guatemala please do